everybody. We are back. If you're accustomed to coming to our channel, you'll know that I'm Brock from Brock's Performance. If not, hi, I'm Brock from Brock's Performance. What do we have? Oh my God, has hell frozen over? A Hayabusa video, a Gen 3 Hayabusa video. Brock, finally, oh my God, what have you been doing? Settle down, we'll get to all that. So, the Hayabusa. Mm, sort of a love-hate. Really loved the bike when it came out. Um, this bike came out, and I just didn't have that much love for it. But I want to, I'm over that now. But I, wanna, I just want to let you guys know what I'm talking about. When the Gen 3 Hayabusa, after all the hype, and oh my god, it's going to be a turbo. It's going to be 1,500 cc's. It's going to have nitrous. Oh, please stop. These guys have a job to do, and that's to get us fast motorcycles, but they also have to pass all the regulations and emissions and all the things that have to go on. Well, when this bike came out, it was late. And this is unsubstantiated, but if you hang out with people in the know, they will tell you that the reason that there is no 2021 model year of the Hayabusa is because they couldn't pass emissions. And from what I understand, Euro 5 wasn't necessarily a problem, but our friends way over on the left coast starts with a C. I'm not going to uh, talk about it anymore because the people who live there say, why are you always talking bad about my state? Well, your state messes stuff up, that's why. So anyway, there was no 2021 Hayabusa because they were struggling getting past California's very, very, very strict emission laws. So um, they did it and we finally got the bike. So I'm thinking, all right, I'm all excited. I put mine on order just like everybody else. I got all the hype, the marketing literature. I got a genuine Hayabusa jacket and I got a plaque and I got all this happy honky dory horse shit when all I really wanted was a fast motorcycle. Well, it showed up, and I figured they had, they had two jobs, right? Not that hard. Job number one, don't screw up the Hayabusa. It's a badass motorcycle. It was unchanged from 2008 to 2020 for a reason. Man, these things are badass bikes. They, it used to be you say Hayabusa and people say, fastest motorcycle money can buy. Well, that's not the case anymore. So, number two, what did they need to do? Well, what, who's their biggest competition? The ZX-14, right? I mean, if you're talking about big displacement, normally aspirated motorcycles, it's Busa versus ZX-14. And quite frankly, since 2012, the ZX-14 has been eating this thing's lunch because they're faster bikes. They got 100 cc's more. Kawasaki did a lot of work. They, know, they knew what they had to beat. So... The new Busa comes out. It's very similar to the old Busa. They did not mess anything up, thank goodness. But it just wasn't fast. It wasn't fast at all. And uh, to the point where, I mean, I sort of cop, I, I sort of cop the attitude about the thing because I was hoping to get in there, you know, let's find out what's going on in the ECU. You know, I work with uh, Brendan at BT Moto. He's really good. We get in there, we check out the ECU, and guess what? Not where that's not where the restrictions are there are some of course speed limit restriction you can adjust the ignition timing you some you can do some other things and you do pick up small gains but nothing like some of the other bikes in the past where when we crack the ECU we opened Pandora's box of horsepower now we got a little bit more and that was really it so I started thinking and looking and thinking and looking and Honestly, John Ulrich, um, Road Racing World, he's probably the only true moto journalist left. Well, uh, Suncrest, of course, but um, I was reading of Road Racing World about the new Hayabusa, and John is extremely thorough. He's called me before when he couldn't get answers from other people uh, to so because he really wants to know what's going on with the bike. So I'm on the throne with my road racing world and I'm checking it out and they start mentioning some emissions deal that Suzuki had to do that they were very proud of. And uh, I start thinking, 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 it's like, son of a bitch, I know what they did and I don't want to fix it. It's too big a pain in the ass. Our customer base these days just don't have the mechanical aptitude 
to get in their engine and fix this thing. Yeah. But I couldn't take it. <laughs> I love Hayabusa's, always have. I, was, I got one of the very first ones that was ever wrecked in the US so I could start developing products for it. So I couldn't just let this bike sit there, but it did take a while. And I gotta tell you, usually in the product development business when you're in the bolt-on world like we are, you don't have to pull the engine. You don't have to take it out. You don't have to start ripping it apart, see how it ticks to see what's going on. For product development, that's silly. We're in the bolt-on world. Well, guess what, fellas and ladies? I found out what was wrong with this bike. And it's a relatively simple fix that produces very nice gains. And we will talk about that right after this. Oh, so what the heck's up with this? Well, this is a printout of our top 50 products. Would any of you like to guess how many of them are for the Hayabusa? Quite a few. So even though the Hayabusa, like I said, a little long in the tooth, went from 08 to 20 and we did most of our work back in 08, we still have people that's hands down our number one motorcycle that we deal with and uh, we really love them. I'm glad we got these things working like they're supposed to. So. Uh, we're going to show you some pretty cool stuff coming up. All right, guys, before we get started, uh, I want to thank our friend and affiliate and sponsored racer, Patrick Cooper. Uh, we're in Dayton, Ohio. Patrick's from the Cincinnati area, so it makes it really uh, convenient for us to work with him. He's been great helping us with uh, clutch development and product development, testing things to see how they they work. Um, Patrick races this bike. It, it, this bike is 100% super stock legal in the XDA super stock class. And Patrick managed to finish fifth in points for the season, which is no small feat considering, as much as I hate to say it, he's a bit of a glutton for punishment because he's bringing a knife to a gunfight. He'd get past the first round, second round. I think he may have even made it to the semis, but that's all on his riding because once he got to the guys that are really good in the class, this bike simply cannot keep up with the ZX-14s. At least it couldn't. We're going to see if we can fix that too. That's a whole nother story. Anyway, so thank you, Patrick. We really appreciate you letting us use your bike for this testing. Uh, if you guys want to walk over here, I'll, 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 sh I'll sort of give you an idea of what, of what we're doing. Um, one of the things that I noticed about in product development for the Hayabusa was, okay, we can put on, you know, we figured out that the Gen 2 exhaust could be made to work, um, but we figured out a Gen 3 specific exhaust could make more power. But when I say more power, we weren't actually producing more power. We were simply robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, velocity stacks and exhaust are about, they're very, very similar. You don't necessarily make power with them, you move power with them. So the velocity stack, especially on these bikes, became a very popular uh, way to make them run a little bit better. And then of course, the exhaust really matters also. But the moral of the story is no matter what we did on the intake side or on the exhaust side, we just didn't get the kind of gains and the kind of performance out of the bike that we expected. And when I say that, it's a Gen 3. We couldn't get Gen 2 results out of it. It was close. I mean, Suzuki did a nice job. And like I said, I, I, sort, of, I sort of copped an attitude a little bit. But the engineers did what they thought was best. They realized that they were limited as far as the amount of power that they could make because of some of the mods they had to do to the bike that they didn't have to do with the other Euro specs and the other California specs. So they just, they doubled down on what they had. The bikes have a lot of torque, so they went ahead and made sure that they used that torque. So a lot of Hayabusa riders, and especially if you're new, um, they don't think the bike's slow at all. It's us old timer guys that know the difference because we've actually been down a quarter mile. Now, if you got a draggy, you also know that the Gen 3 Busa just does not perform like some of the other bikes. But why? Brock, stop talking and tell us. All right, you guys ready? 
First of all, we already spoke about it. This is not it. Now, am I saying you don't need to, to, to do this? You do. Uh, they have a top speed limiter. You can perfect things. You can also adjust some things, adjust your fueling. Um, Patrick runs, uh, he got one of Chris Moore's very first flashes, and he runs the Chris Moore flash. He didn't even have a map in his power commander. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, and Patrick, you can correct me here, but I believe his best pass is an 889 at about 160 miles an hour. So obviously, Chris did a really, really nice job. Uh, Patrick also did another nice job of really paying attention to details on the bike. He's allowed to lighten certain things up, certain things you can't for the class. If we could turn around here, great example of Patrick at work, right? It, you know, it doesn't matter how your bike gets lighter so long as it gets lighter because longer, lower, lighter means faster. So anyway, it's not this. What is it? Does anybody even know what these are these days? <laughs> For those who don't know, these are camshafts, guys. And the problem that we ran into was in order to get that bike through emissions, these are emissions camshafts. So what does that mean to you? It means lift-wise, they're similar to a normal camshaft, but duration-wise, and when I say duration, if you look at the width of the lobe here, you can see this is just very narrow, very pointy. Same thing, the exhaust side is even worse. Very narrow, very pointy. And I'll flash up a couple pictures because I've got some side-by-sides comparing these cams to our new camshafts. Um, and you'll be able to see the big difference that, that's made. So, what are, we, what are we doing? We are replacing the camshafts, and in an attempt to get this mod pushed through XDA, we've done a lot of work. I've got a fixture here, and basically what we, what we can uh, guarantee, if you purchase the camshafts from us, the cam timing, you're not allowed to adjust the cam timing in XDA. So. I have fixtures that are set with the Gen 3 Hayabusa cam timing on the intake and exhaust, but they are sporting our new, bigger, more aggressive, but not crazy aggressive. We're not trying to put a camshaft in there that's going to cause reliability problems and tear up springs and do all that crap that a huge, big race camshaft did. This is, this is more of a hot street kind of camshaft. And what that allows us to do is actually get more air into the engine, which allows us to get more air out of the engine, which equals more horsepower. Now, will the camshafts alone do it? Well, no, because remember I told you, Suzuki doubled down on the torque. So the, the Gen 3 Hayabusa, has got velocity stacks. <laughs> I mean, yeah, hello, the bullhorns, man. These things, look how long these are. And as a general rule, the longer the inlet track is, and this becomes part of the inlet track, the longer the inlet track is, the more bottom and mid-range power you're going to make, but it's going to come at the expense of top-end power. Well, you can buy different stacks, different lengths, right? These helped over these, even without the camshafts because it helped move that power up a little bit. But what we're gonna end up using as part of this kit, the suit, we're gonna call it, I think, the super stock kit, because that's what we're really focusing on. We'll have some more stuff, but we're gonna focus on that by, for now. But with our camshaft combination, and the guys at uh, BT Moto, Bren Tuning Moto, came out with these really nice printed stacks, and you can see they're much, much shorter. So now, that's where stuff starts getting cool. Because, because since we can increase the intake and exhaust duration of the camshaft, that allows us to move the power up much higher and these shorter stacks allow us to get to that area of power. So now where the bike really used to be falling off and just couldn't pull, would not accelerate with draggy, would not accelerate properly at the drag strip, still fast, but not fast, 
Now we're going to put all that together and we're going to show you exactly how it works. And I'm telling you, okay, it's a little bit of a technical mod. Some guys aren't going to want to do it, but it's so simple. I'm going to show you how to do it in this introductory video. It's that easy and we'll get into the meat and potatoes of that right after this. All right, before we, uh, before we get into the drop-in camshaft portion of our program, I wanted to go through a couple little things just to sort of help you prepare. You're gonna want a genuine Suzuki service manual. There's PDFs out there in the forums, I think, um, but I really like the Suzuki stuff versus the generic. It, it's just, they're better put together. They have, the, they're, they're, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a big fan. One of the other things also is do yourself a favor like I didn't do. If you're going to start this project, the first thing you need to do is prop up your gas tank, take your air box off, and get to the top of your valve cover. Now, if you have our Brock's Performance Pair Valve Block Offs, which everyone should have, Patrick did not have. Patrick was still running his pair valve and had it blocked off. The problem that we run into though is, do you see this corrosion? Patrick runs a lot of MR12 fuel, so when you have MR12 fuel residue going up into your pair valve system, it causes a lot of corrosion, and you can see the corrosion in here. Well, all right, corrosion in your pair valve, who cares? We're taking that off because we're going racing anyway. But you the problem that we ran into and, and the reason I'm mentioning this before you start get the pair valve caps off or, or whatever's on there take some type of penetrating oil and spray inside of here and I'll explain why here in, in, a, in a minute but basically what happens is there's some regular steel dowel pins that connect the valve cover to the top of the head. I'll show you here, show you here in a second. And those, valve, those dowel pins get corroded. And we had a hell of a time. Yeah, I thought I was going to have to pull the motor just to get the valve cover off. This thing was tight. And even using wooden dowels so we wouldn't tear stuff up and plastic dowels. Well, see them little pieces? I don't remember where all I broke. There we go. We broke it here. We broke it here. So, hey, full disclosure, I screw stuff up too. And I just went ahead and bought Patrick a new $400 magnesium valve cover from Suzuki because I broke his. So learn from us. Don't be like us. Don't tear your stuff up. So let's go ahead and go over here. I'm going to show you now. And I don't want to sound like an ass, but listen, if you don't know how to take off, if you don't know how to take off your fairings, if you don't know how to get your air box off, um, quite frankly, you don't have any business doing this job and you need to seek out someone that has maybe a little more mechanical skill than you do. But if you're a do-it-yourselfer, we're going to show you everything that you need to know. So one of the first, the very first thing I did when Patrick brought his bike in, I put it up on the dyno to make sure everything was okay. It was. It was within one horsepower of what he made at the very beginning of the season. The bike was, and you know, different. That's really good because we have different weather, right? Um, but the first thing I did, and it's just a matter of good habit, right? I went in cylinder one, two, three, four exhaust valves one through eight, intake valves one through eight. I measured his valve lash, 10 thousandths, 10 thousandths, 11, 11, 10, 10, 10, 10. And on the intake, five, six that was a little tight, six, 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 six. Uh, cranking compression on cylinder number one, cold, was 215, 220, 220, 222. And then I also did a leak down test because that just sort of tells you, you know, a good, a good indicator of how the motor's been doing. Well, 2%, 2%, 3%. And you always have one cylinder that has ball that all the valves open. That was our 4% cylinder. As soon as, if we fired this bike up and rechecked it again cold, that'd be 2%. So mechanically that we know that the engine is in very good shape and is just dying to get this extra horsepower. So couple things that we learned obviously the dowel pin problem so i'm going to pull this over look look how corroded these pins were now and that is like it's it's not quite a press fit when the valve cover comes on 
but it's a loose slip fit so when you get corrosion it the rust builds up and that i'm telling you that that thing well you saw it. we broke the damn thing getting it off so anyway put your penetrating oil in there and then just be patient one of the things that i that i found uh was like i said a wooden dowel or something that you don't you don't have to worry about breaking it and just work with it it'll it'll eventually come off you can try a heat gun not an open flame ever never ever um, and that might help you also but obviously you can't replace the camshafts you don't get the cam cover off of there um, so you're going to need to do that now the other thing that we ran into on these bikes they have this really big robust wiring harness that's not like the gen 2 it's a lot more robust so and it was right over top of the valve cover so we ended up cutting a bunch of tie wraps and almost all of these go here and then in their infinite wisdom we have another two foot long wire that's just for the horn had a hell of a time getting it you can't fit your hands in there and so i asked patrick i'm like do i need to plug your horn back in he's like no i've never pressed my horn <laughs> me either pull in on the clutch go bah, bah. soccer moms fly off the side of the road when you do that anyway um anyway so we don't want anybody getting hurt though um so we're just going to tie this up real nice so if he ever wants to put the horn back on if he sells the bike or something he can do it but basically you've got to get this stuff out of the way you also have to take the throttle bodies just loose you don't even have to disconnect the rest of this stuff just get them out of the way because you can't you've got to be able to get the valve cover up and out and uh, this little so this uh, servo here was in the way and then because we'll be rotating the engine forward and backwards uh, I went ahead and pulled this off and took this idler gear out so that we're not turning the starter whenever you you the motor will turn over in its normal direction no problem but if you try to back it up which hopefully we won't have to do but usually you have to but if you try and back it up it fights the starter so if you just pull just hold on right there we just pulled this assembly out right and uh, that allows the engine to freely spin and then we had to pull out the center plug and the, and the witness plug and the, that was a pain those things have a tendency to stick so we had to uh, we had to use a heat gun and then finally we got the plug out so now step number one and if you look in your manual this is going to be almost identical really it is identical to adjusting your valve lash well if you've never adjusted your valve lash you may be going oh no I can't do it it's not that difficult especially with the manual so the first thing the manual tells you is rotate the engine over to where and I'm, I'm going to go and so you want to rotate the engine you've got a 14 millimeter socket the engine rotates this way right clockwise and all I did was turn it and I hope you can see there's a little line now guys for those of you who are familiar, I did a six hour cam swap or cam chain video on uh, Scott Sullivan's bike. So if you want to get into the real meat and potatoes of this stuff, you can, you can look at that video. But basically uh, my job was turn this to top dead center, make sure that that line inside lines up with this little cutout. And that means we're at top dead center. Now when that happens, I'm going to have to tie wrap this hose out of the way. It's going to get, it's going to annoy us. So when this happens, the camshaft's gonna be in one of two positions. And the position you want is where on the exhaust cam, if you can see, can you see the little line that is parallel with the surface of the head? Let me, uh, you wanna hold that there and I'll, I'll, let me go grab a pointer real quick. So basically what we're looking at is this line there's also a corresponding number one with it is parallel with the surface of the head. And then if you look up in here, do you see that number two? You've got an arrow pointing at that pin. And then on the intake side, we've got number three with an arrow. I don't know if you can see that. So now what we're gonna do I'm going to wipe that cam chain off and I'm going to grab either a paint marker or a Sharpie marker or something. And before we take this thing apart, I'm going to mark those, that number two pin and the number three pin. I'm going to mark it 
and then I'm going to take tie wraps and I'm going to tie wrap the cam chain to each of the gears so that they can't move and then we'll start loosening the uh, cam caps and everything so that we can get the cams out and then all we've got to do is put our new cams in exactly where these came out put it back together so we'll do that here in a second Just put a zip tie on the intake cam keep to hold that in place and then we're going to do the same on the exhaust all right so now we have a zip tie holding the uh, cam chain to the intake cam same thing over here on the exhaust so the next part, we'll be taking off this guide and this little uh, uh, oiling bypass deal here. And we're, we're gonna have to pull the cam chain tensioner out. And then we'll work on getting the valve or the uh, cam caps off. Wow, wow. All right, so we removed the top cam chain guide now. Do the same thing with this little oiling line. All right. And then the only other thing we've got to do is get the cam chain tensioner. Usually the gaskets stay intact. I would make sure, make sure the gasket still looks good. Uh, we will have replacement gaskets available on our site if you want to order some of those when you get your cams. This little deal is interesting. It, it has hydraulic pressure to back it up, but this is a little bit different than what most people are used to seeing. And it, it this thing's actually a little bit tricky. So uh, let's come up here. Let me let me show you what I mean. So the way this works, it has, a, it has a spring and a little gearing mechanism. So basically you have to turn it, screw it in until this line, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to wipe this off. But basically what we're trying to do is get to a point where this little spring right here gets into this tab. And then it'll just stay there. Okay. Now if you saw, I had to manipulate this little wire to hold this in now it's held in against that spring pressure and when we put it back all we have to do is rotate the engine back uh, uh, maybe 10 degrees and it'll click this forward and then the cam chain tensioner will work with the hydraulic backup pressure so you don't have to worry about um, jumping cam timing so now let's go take these pesky camshafts out Okay guys, to, to pull the cam caps off is really very simple. Now if you look, these are all these are all marked, right? So you have a one and a two, <laughs> five, six, nine, ten, seven, eight, three, four, eleven, twelve. The thing that's most important is that this these cam caps, you've got valve spring pressure that is going to cause the cam to, to tip. You've also got dowel pins on the on the pin uh, number six and also here on number four. So those dowel pins, you really want the cam caps to come up as evenly as you can. And over the years, you sort of develop a, a you know a technique for this stuff. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna break these free. So we got 12, 11, 10. Nine, and come over here to eight, seven, six, five, four, three. 
Now, so what's the one and two for? That's when you put it back together, but let me show you something. Now, I can just come in, take out 12, take out 11, take out 10, 9, 8, and 7. They're completely loose. A lot of people will try to go 12, 11, 10, 9, 8 and try to keep the whole thing. Man, it just takes a really, really long time when all you really need to do is take all these loose and then concentrate on these four to bring it up level. So I usually just do one of these numbers. Well, I don't even have hardly any pressure there. Hardly any pressure there. Now you'll start feeling right there. Now I, I feel pressure. So I know there's a camshaft spring pressing up against that. I go until it gets light again. Then I come over here, light, light. Look at this. this. This thing's coming up with very little hassle. All right, now, what you don't want to happen is to shoot <laughs> any of these parts out because there is spring pressure underneath here. Sometimes you have to get a little tap. Boom, just like that. Now, remember, you've got dowel pins in pin six and pin four. Make sure you got all your screws all the way loose. I've heard that before. I have that, I'm told. <laughs> all right, now we just lift everything up. You can shove rags in here if you're really worried about it. Oh, I was backwards. The pins, the pins were under five and under six. So we've got our dowel pins. We've got everything out. We're just going to take this over here, set it there for now, and do the same thing over here. All right, that one's being a little bit of a pain, but now we're good. Last one. All right. So I have to give it just a little bit of a tap. And there we go. Okay, there we go. Dowel in place, dowel in place. We're gonna do the same thing, just set this over here. All right, now for the fun stuff. Give me two minutes. All right, guys, uh, I just want to show you a little trick. I just got a little crappy mirror. I don't even know where I've had it. It's been in my toolbox forever. But this helps you. If we do this, now you can see. See my mark? That's exactly where we want to put the number three on the new intake cam. And then if you can see down here, we have the same situation. See the arrow? And I don't know if you can see it, but there's an, the arrow right at that, that black pin. That's where we're going to put the new exhaust. Now, one of the things we don't want to do, if you let the cam chain fall down in, it can get sort of tangled up in the gear down in the bottom. So just to be safe, I'm going to go ahead and just clamp that down. And now I'm going to cut my intake tie wrap naturally. I don't want any debris falling down in the engine, so I'm going to cut it right there, pull everything up. I'm going to do the same thing on the exhaust. Now all I'm going to do is just gently lift my intake cam up, rotate it a little bit. That gives me enough slop to, oops, to get it out. Now my intake cam's out. I'm gonna go set this over here for now. Now I'm gonna just sort of take, pull the exhaust cam up. Make sure that stuff's just out of the way. I'm just gonna sort of hold the cam chain up like that. That's all we need to do. Now I'll grab this cam. So these are the Gen 3 cams that we just pulled out. I wanna show you what's really cool about these fixtures. I'm gonna take our intake fixture that says 2022 BUSA OEM. I'm gonna take Patrick's 2022 BUSA cam, gently drop it down. So we have a key down here that holds the cam in position. 
We have an indicator here that tells us we're number three. We have no play. So now I'm going to pull his cam back out. Oh, I need to put a bigger hole in that. Now we're going to use, see our, our intake cam. Uh, this one is stamped 02. Patrick has, <laughs> he has number two. Number one's in there. Chris Moore has number three. He didn't bother to tell anybody. Thanks, Chris. Shit flies though, don't it? So, now we're going to just confirm that our camshaft is the exact same cam timing as what came out. Boom. No slop. That means that Whatever cam timing that was, and we didn't check it. I'll give you the numbers. I'll put them in the long description. I have them all written down. I just don't have them off the top of my head. I want to say the, uh, the OEM exhaust cam was right around 100, 101. Don't hold me to that, but it was pretty low, which is fine. You're not allowed to change them anyway. So now we know that the intake cam is ready to go back in in the exact same spot. But before we do that, we're going to take Patrick's exhaust cam put it in the exhaust cam fixture there we go stock exhaust cam fits right in now we're going to take our exhaust also marked 02 there we go perfect so that means that the cams are 100% ready to drop in. They're going to have the exact same cam timing. The intake cam, it was up pretty high. I want to say 106, 107. May have been, even been higher than that. Whatever. That's what they put it at. That's what it needs to be at. We're not going to argue with it. So, in order to put the cams in, we're going to start with the exhaust first because we've got to make sure we don't have any slop in the front of the cam chain when we roll the tab over so that our our number two mark lines up exactly with that black pin. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and go do some of this. And guys, you know, a lot of guys like cam lube, they like all that kind of stuff. That's fine. If you look in the manual, they use motor oil. All you really need to do, you can see how all of the journals in the head are already very well oiled. I'm just gonna take a little bit of oil, put them on the journals here, and then we are ready. Sort of lay this down roughly where it needs to go. I'm gonna I'm gonna need some light to go along with my little mirror here that I'm trying to drop down in. Alright okay, guys, so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to put pressure on the front of this chain and bring this cam in to where it lines up with that with the other pin. Mark, can I get you to come over here? Sorry guys, I gotta have a special light holder. <laughs> And I'll, I'll get everything set up for you guys because you're you're gonna have a hell of a time seeing anything from that side But I'll get you sort of close All right <clears throat> Come over around this side since it's rather difficult to see position number two I want you to look over here see position number one where the arrow is That shows very clearly that I do not have this cam in the right spot Asterix if you don't put these cams in in exactly the same manner that they came out, you're going to bend all your valves as soon as you try and start the bike. This is the critical part. We have to make sure that these cams go back in exactly the way the old ones came out. So, all I'm going to do, looks like I'm off one tooth. I'm going to rotate it back. Okay. Now, that looks like we're right. The big question is, did anything move here? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually, if you can see, the, the crankshaft has actually moved backwards a little bit. So now I've got tension on the top of my cam chain with my hand. Can you, can you see that? Right? And I'm actually pulling backwards a little bit. Now I'm going to come in here, turn the crankshaft right there to where the line is lining up where it's supposed to. Then I'm going to confirm that my number one is parallel to the top of the head. The arrow is, the arrow is level with the, the surface of the head. So now, because I have the crank in the proper position and I have the arrow parallel with the surface of the head, my number two should be on the black pin I know it is tight in there. We'll get the uh, mirror out also so we can see the other side. 
but we're not quite ready for that just yet. All right, so now I know I can see, even if the camera can't, I can see that my number two is in the right spot. So all, well, all I'm gonna do is tie wrap, go ahead and put another zip tie on this exhaust right now so that it can't move. Okay, now I can still see this black mark. I'm gonna actually make it, because I know that's gotta be hard to see on the camera. So now, I'll do exactly the same thing with the intake cam, and all I'm trying to do is line up this arrow with the other black pin, and what we'll, what we'll do, we'll end up counting because, and your manual explains all this, you'll have to look in it, but there's 15 pins between the number two at the top here and its arrow and the number three and its arrow. There'll be 15 pins exactly. And that way we know we put these cams back in exactly the way they came out. Let me move this out of the way. You know what? I am going to... I've just made a black mark where this arrow is. And I'm going to line that up with the black mark on this cam chain. Right there is where we want to be that black and that black, but I'm gonna have to, in order to get enough uh, slack here, pull off my hemos. I do some the eighth grade. So now, there we go. There's my black pin. There's my black pin. Now, I didn't point this out on the exhaust side, but you see these, uh, see these circlips right here? These circlips have to be in these grooves before you can put the cam caps back on. It, and it doesn't really matter where the grooves go. I like them turned where they're down. And then a little dab of oil here on these journals. Said we know it's oily on the other side. So right now, I should be able to put one more zip tie. Now before, before I go zip tying this on, let's, let's double check to make sure that my arrow is exactly where that black pin is. Got it? We are in the right spot. Now, we're just gonna hold this in place so that it can't move. All right, now, when we put the cam cap on, everything's gonna tighten up, but before we do that, I'm gonna count these pins. I'm going to make sure that we have the right number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All right, guys. So now, cams are not all the way back in, but very, very close. We know that there's no slop in the front of the cam chain because we don't want, we want to make sure that we don't jump timing down at the bottom, and we want to make sure we have our, our pins here. Uh, counted 15 and and we put them back exactly where the other cams came out now We're going to put the valve cover back on or I mean the cam caps back on and we're going to put the uh, cam chain tensioner in Snap that so that it's putting tension on and then we'll rotate the, the engine over to make sure everything is working like it's supposed to Let me grab some cam caps and I'll be right back. All right guys once again I'm just going to take a little dab of oil here put it on the journals We know the bottom of it is oiled up real nice Maybe put a little dab here, a little behind my ears. So. All right, so back, same deal. We have to have our dowel pins in place, and we are going to concentrate on one. Now, now you see we have why, why we have one and two. One and two is actually still five and six, but we're going to concentrate on tightening one, two, three, four to bring this as straight down as we possibly can. Um, make sure that we've got our our cams are in the proper position that they're sort of seated down there. And now we'll come over here, put everything back on. And what I like to do, I, I like to just go, I just tighten them down until you get a little bit of resistance, just by hand. Same deal here on three and four. Got it down to where it's just barely seated, a little bit of resistance, a little more. All right, see we've got a little, see how much gap we have here versus here. So now we know we have to, we want this thing to come straight down. So we're gonna start putting more pressure here. 
do the same thing here. And you'll notice this got loose because as I was tightening this down, the whole the whole cam cap moved. So back to just really all we're doing is is pulling the pulling a little bit of resistance out of it, and we're going against the spring pressure. Luckily, these bikes don't have a tremendous amount of spring pressure. Some you put gangster cams or gangster springs, this job becomes quite a bit more critical because it, if you snap one of these cam caps, you basically have to buy a new head. I don't know, the machining tolerances for Suzuki, they're, they're so good you might be able to swap cam caps, but in the past you never could. And then I'm just trying to finish it down where it's snug. All right, and that, I am just bare, I'm just barely snugging these things down. Now, one thing I should mention, um, we got a little debris here from uh, the from the, the rubber on the cam caps. It's always a good idea to try to get that stuff out of there best you can, but there's always going to be some residue. So long as you have them cleaned off, you know, pretty well before you put the valve cover back on, you shouldn't have any problems. These things aren't real bad about leaking. I usually don't even use any gasket sealer. I know Suzuki says too, but I, I just don't. I, I don't see the reason. A lot of times my motors don't last, <laughs> they don't stay in the engine long enough to, to, to worry about that. At least they didn't used to. All right, so I'm just going to go back over this. I'm going to hand tighten everything. Um, and then I am going to torque. That's one thing, uh, you know me and torquing, I, I can do it with this. But I want to I get the actual torque spec out of the book for these cam caps to make sure that they're exactly right. But I'm going to go ahead and snug them down before I put the final torque on them. Actually, from here... Turn this down to the lightest setting. Okay, so now we have the exhaust cam almost fully installed. I'm going to go ahead and grab the, uh, the uh, intake cam cap and do the same thing. All right, same deal. Dow pin, dow pin, and we're just going to concentrate on one, two, three, and four for now. Make sure that our cam's in the right position. flat on the head. Go ahead and cheat a little bit here. Twelve. Okay, so now we have the cam caps. We will have to put the final tightening torque on that, but before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and put the cam chain tensioner in to try to make sure that we've got everything positioned correctly. One of the things that's nice when the, when the engine's not in the bike, you can sort of come back here and press, press on the tensioner, but there we go. I don't know if you saw that, but I just pulled a bunch of the slop out of the chain just by pressing down on the back side of the tensioner. That'll take enough slop out to where when we put the tensioner back in, it will take all the tension back out, but I'll, sh I'll show you that. I'll show you that here shortly. All right, guys, so I've already pressed this in. Now, if this is extended, don't try to put it in. You'll never get past the hydraulic force that's in here and you'll cause yourself damage. You'll strip the head. You don't want any of that. Since this is moved down nice and short, I should be able, there, there, there is a specific way that this goes in. If you can see here, you've got an oiling hole here. You've got an oiling hole here. So this, the tensioner is gonna slide in just like this. Now, you see how it went, and, and it actually, I mean, it, it seated all the way down. I'm going to go ahead and hand tighten this again. All right, so I've got this snugged. I will put the final torque spec on it here in a moment. But the first thing we really need to do, we've got to get this slop out of the cam chain, and we don't want, we don't want to jump timing down here. So all I'm going to do, this is... The way this tensioner works, as soon as I back the engine up, and I forget what the book says, 10 degrees, maybe 20, I'll be able to feel the tensioner pop back out so it's got that spring pressure. And then when I rotate the engine back forward, it's going to take the slop out of the top of this chain, and it'll take the slop out of all the rest of it. 
but this is really important. Yeah, go around to the other side. <clears throat> Even though I have these zip tied, I'm gonna try and keep just a little bit of pressure here. And when I say a little bit of pressure, that way all the rest of the cam chain has got as much tension on it so that it can't jump off of the gear on the crank or here. Of course, it's gonna be tough to jump because we've got our, our zip ties on here still. But let me show you what I'm talking about. Just put a little bit of tension. Now, we're gonna rotate the engine back counterclockwise and basically, all right. So now, the question is, did it pop? I thought I heard it, but maybe not. Right now, we're only holding it together with, we're only holding this, this together with spring pressure because we haven't started the engine, so you don't have the hydraulic pressure. So now, we're gonna come back over. Last time, I promise. I had rotated the engine over backwards. Now, and I, you gotta remember, I got zip ties on here, so I can't really move stuff that much. But you can see my, right now, my, my, my witness mark on the crank is lined up where it's supposed to be. My arrow is, is parallel to the surface of the cylinder head. My number two pin, the black pin, is exactly where it needs to be. I don't know if you can see it. We'll put the mirror back there. We'll throw Mr. Mirror back here. Oops. All right. Now, I can see my arrows on number two. I can see my arrow is on number three, the black pin. So I know those are correct. So now, I'm gonna zip this tie wrap off. Make sure I don't put any tie wrap chunkies in the motor. So now I'm gonna try and get this off of here. Yet again, to try and leave the zip tie chunks out of the engine whenever possible. All right, no zip tie chunks. Now, obviously we still have to retorque this stuff, but one of the things I wanna do, I'm gonna come over here now, and I'm just gonna turn the engine in, a, in its clockwise direction and I want to feel, I should feel no resistance whatsoever. No problems, no valves hitting pistons. Right now we are turning nice and smooth. All right. So we've basically completed this. I'll show you, I'll show you the end of the torquing and all the rest of the stuff. But now, um, <laughs> and here's, here's sort of the tough part. Now we're gonna go back in and we're gonna check the valve lash again. And if the valve lash needs to be changed, we have to do this all over again. If the valve lash is okay, we torque everything down, we put the guide back on, the little oiling hose, and we're ready to put the valve cover back on and get this thing on the dyno and see what kind of power she makes. And guys, for those of you who are paying attention, uh, these are seven and a half foot pounds, with, and this is an inch pound torque wrench, so it's 90 inch pounds. All right, good to go. Now we've got to do is put our cam chain uh, guide on here and our oiling tube, and we're good to go. All right, go ahead and put the top cam chain guide in, and that gets torqued to the same 90 inch pounds. Well, not with that. Yeah, about the same. I can't fit it in there. Got to ad lib. All right. Guys, you can see this is one of those situations where you've got a longer bolt on the exhaust side than you do on the intake. Don't swap those around because if you drive them in, you'll break your cam cap. Well, if you drove the long one into the short end, you break your cam cap. All right, I'm gonna go confirm the torque on this. I'll be right back. Oh, and as luck would have it. <laughs> oh, maybe. All right. That was shitty. Honestly, I don't trust it. Oh. We'll just do this. Do not over tighten, don't break it. Ah, got a little snug. Perfect. All right, cam chain tensioner, and then we're good. And it is the same pressure and the same torque.
All right. We are torqued down. Now, I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. Even though the Suzuki manual doesn't say so, a Gen 2 valve cover fits on a Gen 3. I measured all this up. There's no part cross-reference anywhere, but uh, instead of $400 from Suzuki, we're going to spend $97 on eBay to replace this one that I took off my other Hayabusa. <laughs> Before we do that, though, uh, I am going to go back in and check the valve lash. Um, I, I glanced at it, the two valves that I, were, I was wondering about, and they seem fine, but I'm going to spin the engine over a little bit, make sure everything's okay, and if everything's within spec, we're going to put this back together and try to get this thing on the dyno and let you guys see what kind of power we picked up. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and briefly show you how to check the valve lash in case you want to check it for yourself. It all starts with top dead center, and I have, I have the line back centered up, at this particular rotation, we don't have the, the, the arrow. Now, we don't actually have the arrow lined up, but it doesn't matter. We're going to check it at this and then spin it 360 degrees and check it again because you can check half the valves the way it is right here and then spin it again and check the other half. But I'll show you that up here where it's going to make sense to you. All right, guys, because these cams have the same base circle diameter as what we took out, you really shouldn't need to adjust the valves. These are just regular feeler gauges. For you guys who aren't familiar, um, it's, you get them at any auto parts store. These just happen to be curved. It makes things a little bit nicer. These are straight. All I'm going to do now with the, with the crankshaft in its current position at top dead center, I can check the intake and exhaust on cylinder number, cylinder number one. I can check the exhaust on cylinder number two and the intake on cylinder number three. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Now, I know that with the other cams in there, we had I had five thousandths uh, and six thousandths on valve intake valve one and two. So if I take my five thousandth shim gauge and all I'm going to do is stick it between the, the tappet or bucket and the bottom of the cam and you can see it the six thousandths will not fit and the five thousandths does all right now if i get six back out over here according to this this one should be a six a little tight uh, it is tight but let's check instead of a tight six that's a little tight check it here at number four all right four falls through so it's between a four and a five all right, so this was a five. This went from a six to a four. Three is the minimum, so four is actually fine. Now, I don't want to confuse things because this is sort of a, a basic drop-in video, but a lot of people don't realize that your valve lash determines the effective duration of your camshaft because if you have more valve lash, that means you've got more of a gap between uh, when the when the lobe comes around so if you tighten up that lash it's the equivalent of giving you more duration with the same camshaft problem is you don't want to get too tight and the book says three thousandths is the minimum we've got four so we're golden so long as we don't have anything less than three there's no reason for us to to loosen it up anymore and so long as we don't get out of a window uh, you can see these were all basically fives and sixes before we took it apart. So long as these stay in the four to five range, we're fine. Same thing on the exhaust. They were almost all tens. So long as there's something close to that, they're not too deep, they're too, not too uh, wide a gap or too small a gap, we won't have to adjust them. So we're just going to go in and make sure, and the book spec is the book spec. You look in your book you're going to buy. I don't have to tell you all this shit. Buy the book. If you're going to do this job so i'm going to keep on going here just to make sure we're within the safe uh, operating region and if so valve cover goes back on and we are finished all right guys i know i've got chicken scribble here but we were just able to do half the valves cylinder number one we got a five and a four cylinder number one on the exhaust we got a nine and a ten we got two tens on cylinder number two on the exhaust and two fives on cylinder number three on the intake now same deal I just need this line to go 360 degrees. There we go. 360 degrees. Now I'll be able to check the valves, the other valves that I wasn't able to check previously. 
All right, guys, I just checked the other half of the engine. All the exhaust cams, they were all exactly the same. We had a little bit of movement on, uh, on the intake, but all within spec. So our smallest is four thousandths, our biggest is six on the intake. And on the exhaust, our tightest is nine, our loosest, and our two that were more loose, for some reason, decided to tighten up. So we've got a nine and all the rest of them are tens all the way across. Valve lash is done. Now, cameraman just brought up an interesting <laughs> question. Well, Brock, what if you had to adjust them? Then we got to pull the cams back out again pull the tappets or buckets up and underneath there you can find a little shim. So you have to have a shim kit if you're actually going to adjust your valves. If you and I could go in each one of those, I can measure it with a with a micrometer and put in a shim that's a thousand thicker or a thousand thinner and get them exactly where I want them all the way across. This thing's almost perfect. I'm not going to mess with that. That'd be a whole hell of a lot of work. And also from an apples to apples standpoint, now we can see what just the camshafts are worth because I just took this bike off the dyno a day or so ago and the weather's about the same. So we're gonna get a good reading. Now, one thing I'm curious about is now that we're getting more air into the engine and more air out, how does that affect cranking compression? Let's find out. So with the, with the uh, Gen 3 cams, this bike made 215 pounds of cranking compression in cylinder number one. Let's just see what that turns into now. Oh, sorry guys, gonna be one second. <laughs> it's hard to turn the engine over when everything's unplugged in the dash. All right, let's see what we got. Hey, remember I told you we always screw up? We did it again. No starter gears means the starter just spins, but the engine doesn't. So here's the starter, guys. <laughs> and this is the gear uh, reduction mechanism that allows the starter to actually spin the crankshaft. Comes in handy when you want to start your engine. For those of you who didn't make a template, the two long ones go right here. All right, let's try this again. Try it one more time. All right, so now we now have 200 pounds cranking. Well, that brings up a really interesting point. We lost 15 pounds of cranking because the valves are open longer. It's just that simple. Longer duration cams are going to have less cranking compression than shorter duration cams. Now, this is a really tough one. I don't know if I should tell the story. First time I put cams in a bike, I had a 1260 motor with stock cams. When I twisted the gas, I could really feel it in my butt dyno, right? Well, I go to the track and the bike doesn't run. It runs like 1070s. It's just not fast. It, it was crazy. I was 18 years old. And so one of the guys says, you need bigger camshafts if you got a bigger motor like that. So I go and I buy the biggest set of camshafts that I could afford. I put them in and I take that bike out for a ride. And I got to tell you, my ass dyno frowned. I, that instant rush of torque that I used to get just wasn't there anymore. And I thought, oh man, this thing's going to be a, just a pooch at the racetrack. And um, so I go to the racetrack. And I went from 1070s, my very first pass, to a 1010, and the bike went 15 miles an hour faster because it actually got air in and got air out. My butt dyno was not necessarily happy because I, I had the, uh, it seemed like I lost torque, but honestly, you can't feel the torque that it's making in the higher RPMs like you can in the lower RPMs. So when you do this mod, if you don't think your bike is as snappy, that's normal. Then go out and run it in land speed or at the drag strip or against your favorite mouthy buddy and whoop his ass because your bike's gonna be a whole lot faster even though your butt's frowning. Does that make sense? All right, cylinder number two, 210. And it was previously 220. So we're seeing a pattern here. We're, we, we're dropping 10, 10 pounds or so. 
We're going to keep going across the board just for shits and giggles because it's fun. Right at 210. Right at 210. We were at 220. So 222. Let's see if we get to, let's see if we get 212. All right. Twelve. The consistency is astounding. <laughs> All right, let's put this thing together. Go make some power. Hey guys, another little pro tip here. When you go to put this little plug back in, make sure you put some anti-seize on the threads. These things have a tendency. These are just cast, and they're hell to get out sometime. I've had to break them out before. So put anti-seize on the threads here. Put anti Go ahead and put some anti-seize on this, even though it's since it's steel, it's not that big a deal. And then make sure you don't over tighten it. Make sure you go to the book spec or just hand tighten it. I mean, it's an O-ring. So long as it's crushed, it's going to seal. So anyway, that's the last interruption. Let's get on the dyno. I want to see what kind of power this makes. All right. So as you can see, I changed. Believe it or not, I do bathe. Um, it's the following day. We weren't able to get the bike finished up in time. We just, we just ran out of time and the weather is the same today as it was yesterday. At least that's what they were calling for. So here we are. We have the cams in the bike a hundred percent. Um, now one of the things that we did, uh, Patrick has had his bike on our dyno on two separate occasions before set up the same way. I'll show you that here in a second, but we set it up exactly how he brought it in, which means uh, he doesn't have our flash that we're working with through BT Moto. He's got his more Mafia flash. Uh, he's got different velocity stacks. He does not have the BT Moto stacks. And unfortunately, we ran out of them, so I couldn't even put some in for this test. But really, we want an honest AB. What do the cams, just the cams, mean? When he brought the bike in this last time, it does have a power commander on it, but there's zero map. So everything is set back exactly like it was when he, uh, when he first brought it in. Let me, uh, let me fire some stuff up here and let you guys see a little bit about what I'm talking about. So when Patrick first brought me this bike, it was on October 6th of 2022, and it made 199.19 horsepower. Now, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> I had to call Patrick up and say, hey Patrick, do you mind if the whole world knows what kind of horsepower numbers you've got? Because most racers don't want to tell that. And he's like, eh, I don't care, it is what it is. I've been racing it all year. They know I don't have a bunch of horsepower, so we're good to go. Anyway, very nice 199. Now, when we came up with the whole cam thing, I said, hey Patrick, would you mind bringing your bike up? I want to try this out. He said no problem, so he brought the bike up. The first thing we always do is make a baseline run. So the baseline run, exactly like it is, MR12 set up exactly like this with the stock cams. Check this out. <laughs> On 10-6 of 2023, <laughs> one year exactly to the day, and if you remember I said Suzuki makes a hell of an engine, look how brutally consistent. Really, from 199.19 to 199.62, these guys know what they're doing. So anyway, can we break 200 horsepower now? Um, I believe we will. I guess the real question is, is going to be by how much. So enough yammering. Let's make some noise.
was a pretty good first pull. So if you want to come up here and take a look, first pull 209.81, but as I was making the run, I was watching the air fuel and let me highlight the green here. And you can see that we're at 13.57. Now I'm not saying that's lean enough to cause damage, but I am saying that's lean enough to cause me concern. You guys have to remember, we let more air in, it only makes sense that we're gonna need more fuel. So with our combination, it's gonna be cams, velocity stacks, pipe, sprint filter, and mapping to put all that together. Now, I'm what I'm gonna do here, just because when Patrick came in, he had a zero map in his power commander. I'm gonna make another couple runs, but before I do that, I'm just gonna safe and make this thing safer. Highlight 80, 90, 100% throttle. And I'm gonna give it 10% throttle, or 10% additional fuel. Now, 10%, if you're a Kawasaki owner, you're going, oh my God, the bike's gonna drown. If you're a Suzuki, GSX-R, or Busa guy with dual injectors, you know that 10% because we're tuning on the lower injectors, doesn't really make that much more power, but I'm hoping it'll bring it back down somewhere around 13.2. Naturally, the bike's gonna have to be tuned for the cams now, but that's beyond the scope of this. I just wanna get a good feel for exactly what the cams do with a very similar air fuel ratio to these 199s, and right now we don't have that. So let me just straighten that up real quick. We'll see what kind of power we get, and then we'll talk about concluding the video right after this. quick and easy. Um, let me go ahead and take, we've got one uh, run that has this crazy flyer that runs back. I don't really know if that's the correct air fuel. I just know it's a bit of a nuisance. I'm going to take it out of the way. And now let's just come over here and you can see apples to apples, air fuel to air fuel. We are a dead ass overlay and we went from 199.19 up to 210.75. Now, asterisk, when I say Patrick doesn't have our combination, I mean our new recently developed combination. He'll switch over to it, but for right now, that just goes to show you what the cams are worth. This bike's gonna have to be fully tuned again. I'm gonna go ahead and do that for him, and then we'll try and get it to the racetrack and bring you the results here real soon. But um, anyway, I hope you guys like this. I know, I know it ran a little bit long, uh, and I know some of you are like, oh, 10 horsepower, that's it? Putting cams in, that's all? No, listen, dude, you have to know exactly what that means. As fast as this bike's going, it's gonna take two to three horsepower to pick up one mile an hour. Well, Patrick is a solid two to three mile an hour down on the fastest ZX14s in the class, so this right here, in combination with the Ram Air, considering that the Suzuki is so aerodynamically superior, I believe this little 10 horsepower should put him right exactly where he needs to be. So maybe he can take his number five from this year and turn it into a much lower number next year. But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We still have to get the rules approved. But Anyway, watch our website. We're gonna have all of this stuff available. We'll let you know exactly what you need. And until then, I'm Brock from Brock's Performance. Stupid fast, we'll see you then.